All right, guys, we're going to talk about what it means to pray in the name of Jesus, what it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus, because in our modern day, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. You know, it's it's commonly perceived that if you don't speak the word Jesus when you're praying at the end of your prayer, then you didn't pray in the name of Jesus. And there's a lot of, of denominations uh, that will actually say if they didn't pronounce the name Jesus over you when you were baptized, if, for example, they said the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, when they baptize you, then you weren't baptized in the name of Jesus. And they'll say that you need to get baptized again because you're not really saved. Um, and even there's a, a movement going on, some of you probably encountered, where people say you actually have to pronounce the name of Jesus right. You can't say Jesus. You have to say Yeshua or Yahashua. Otherwise, you're not even saying the name Jesus. You're not doing anything in the name of Jesus. But all these things aren't really accurate okay doesn't mean that their heart's not in the right place but it's not biblical okay we need to understand what it means to what what it means to the name what the name means it doesn't mean the pronunciation of a word it is referring to the attributes okay something that pertains to that person okay check this out exodus thirty-four fourteen. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. It says his name is Jealous. It's not saying that his, the, the actual pronunciation of his name is Jealous. It is saying this is an attribute that applies to him. That which uh, he is defined as. Is jealous. That is one of his characteristics. He is a jealous God, and that's what it says. Whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Okay. So this refers to things that pertain to them, not the pronunciation of the word. And that's why, you know, a lot of people have it mistaken too. Exodus 20 and 7 and the Ten Commandments, when it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's not just speaking of cursing or using the name of God as a curse word. That's not what he was talking about here. He's saying don't claim to represent God. You know, you're, you're saying that you represent him, but then your actions are not in accordance with the things that pertain to God. Okay, and I'm going to prove that to you right now. The name of the, taking the name of the Lord your God in vain is not talking about saying God as a cuss word. Look what it says right here. Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. At the end, it's going to talk about what it means to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, but we're going to go through these two, three verses right here. Listen. Two things have I required of thee. He's, he's praying. Deny, deny them not. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. So he's saying, don't make me too poor. Don't make me too rich. Feed me with the food convenient for me. That's just just adequate for me. Lest I be full, verse 9, and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and take the name of my God in vain. This is Proverbs 30, verse 9 in King James. Lest I be poor and still and take the name of my God in vain. Okay. When he says, take the name of my God in vain, he's not saying, lest I be poor and still and then say the name of God is a curse word. That's not what he's saying there. He's saying that as a servant, as someone who claims I, I, to be a servant, a, represent, a representative of God, I don't want to be in a situation where I don't, my actions don't conform to what my profession is. Okay. So he's saying, lest I be poor and still and take the name of my God in vain. And Paul said, in, was it uh, Romans 2? He said, the name of God is blasphemed on account of those who are saying they represent God. but And they're telling people don't steal, but they're stealing. And they're telling people don't commit adultery, but they're committing adultery. He said, the name of God is blasphemed on account of that. And that's what he was praying there. He said, don't let me be so poor that I steal and take the name of my God in vain. So, so taking the name of the Lord your God in vain is professing to represent God and then you are doing things that are contrary to him you're misrepresenting him okay and that's what he's talking about here thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain don't be a hypocrite 
is what he's saying. So when it, <clears throat> whenever it's saying to pray in the name of Jesus, okay, it is not specifying that you pronounce the word Jesus, okay, at the end of your prayer. Now I think it's good to do that because you are, you know, it's a reminder of of what you're doing. But you you could pray in the name of Jesus without even saying the name Jesus. And still be praying in the name of Jesus. Okay. And Colossians 317 right here. He says whatsoever you do in word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God and the Father by him. He says whatsoever you do in word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now he's not saying go around every single thing you do. And every single thing you say. And, and say in the name of Jesus every time you do something. Or every time you say something. He's not saying that. He's saying, whatever you do, whether you do it or it's something you're saying, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, as a representative of Christ, you know, the the and frankly speaking, it's because there's a new life of Christ in you that is revealing the life of Christ, the actions, the character of Christ in you. That's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. That is, it's not about us no more. It's not about what we can do. But now there's a new life given through the Holy Spirit that reveals the attributes and the character of Christ. And so when we're living and we're praying and we're, it's all supposed to be in the name of the Lord Jesus, it's all supposed to be in accordance with that new life. This is to say, walk in the spirit. OK, walk in the spirit. Live in accordance with the spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit reveals who Christ is. Check this out. Galatians 4 and 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son, that is the spirit of Christ, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, so this is the spirit that cries, Abba, Father, right there. God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So this is the attribute of the spirit of Christ. The spirit cries, Abba, Father. The spirit of Christ, the, the spirit of God's son cries, Abba, Father, and God sent that spirit into your heart. It didn't come from you. It came. It's it's of Christ and God sends it into your heart. But as as you receive this spirit that cries, Abba, Father, now you are to um, act and speak in accordance with that. That is, there's a new life in you producing the things of the spirit. That's why even though it's the spirit that cries, Abba, Father, once you receive it, Look what it says, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received, this is Romans 8, 15, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Okay, so the spirit cries, Abba, Father, but that spirit sent into our hearts, and now we are functioning in this new life that is revealed in us, the life of Christ, his attributes and character revealed in us by the Spirit, and it's by the Spirit that we cry, Abba, Father. So it's not of us. Paul said, it's not me. I'm crucified with Christ. My old man is gone, but now I'm, I'm living in the newness of life, but it's not me no more. It's Christ that lives in me. His attributes, the thing, the righteousness of God in Christ, the pureness of Christ, the thing that flows from him, this new life is given to me, and I'm able to partake in it and to share in it. And because of this new life, I'm able to have access now even unto God. By the Spirit, the Spirit cries, Abba, Father, and by that Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. And it says down here in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Verse 18, for through him, that is through Jesus, we both, uh, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one spirit unto the Father. Have access by one spirit unto the Father. You have access by the spirit of Christ. Notice that the spirit was crying, Abba, Father. That is a petition to God, a connection uh, uh, to God. And then by that spirit, we partake in that connection to God. That we're able to, by the spirit, cry, Abba, Father. And he hears us. Hallelujah. He hears us. It's by the spirit we have access to God. So it's not just when you, when you for example, are crying, Abba, Father, by the spirit. When you're, when you're praying, and you say, Father. That is not of yourself. That is the life of Christ in you. Okay. That is praying in the name of Jesus. 
You could say, you could pray, Father, and and say what's on your what's in your heart to say by the Spirit, because you're you're meshed together with the Spirit, and that's praying in the name of Jesus. I'm gonna show that to you right here. Let's see, might have to look it up. No, it's right here. Okay. Mm. All right here. I didn't uh, I think I got it. All. Okay. Romans 8:25. But Romans 8:26. Likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Okay? Uh, our weaknesses. Because we're weak. We don't know what to pray for, but the spirit, the life of Christ in us produces what we need hallelujah he said for the spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought romans eight twenty six. but the spirit itself <laughs> maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered okay now now sometimes there are words that we understand and sometimes there are groanings which cannot be uttered you know and and this is what people refer to when they when they talk about praying in tongues okay now i know that's controversial and you know i don't believe you have to pray in tongues or speak in tongues to be saved so i'm, I'm not condemning here but I, I want to convey what praying in tongues is referring to it is not just speaking a bunch of gibberish but it is we don't know always what we should pray for but, but the spirit gives us unction to speak even though our understanding is not able to perceive it okay but the spirit gives us that what we should pray for man it comes out in a, in a prayer language that is not our own it is the, the language of the spirit okay check it out uh this is first corinthians 14 2 he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto god okay not speaking to men but unto god for no man understands him okay remember over here we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Right here, no man understand him. Okay. How be it in the spirit he speaks mysteries. It's not something that, that we understand, but the spirit understands it. And in the spirit we speak mysteries. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Okay. Because prayer builds you up. And that's what he says later on in, in Jude, for example. But ye beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Okay. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Okay, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful because I'm not understanding. You know, we don't know what we should pray for, but the spirit knows, and it intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be expressed. But the spirit praying. It still builds us up because there actually there's a prayer language coming out, but it is the words of the spirit. OK, and it's a beautiful thing. And he says that builds you up. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. OK, and the things I do comprehend and in the things I don't comprehend because my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. He says here, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Because sometimes there, I'm t when, okay, this is just, I'm, I'm explaining what speaking in tongues is. Okay, the Bible says they spake with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. It is not something that you just make up, okay, and you just say a bunch of gibberish and you say that's speaking in tongues. It is, it is something that flows from the Holy Spirit and it and it is an unction of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's saying here that just as, okay, this is, I'm just trying to explain the best I can and God help me. But just as the spirit cries, Abba father, this is, these are words that pertain to the spirit, but now receiving the spirit, we cry, Abba father. But in addition to that, there are some things that are beyond our understanding that are not revealed to us right now, but the spirit knows and the spirit intercedes for us through a language that we don't even understand. Okay, and that's what it's saying that that 
in addition to the understanding, because we understand Abba Father, but in addition to that, there is a, a, a prayer language, a praying in an unknown tongue. And in, in Romans first, or excuse me, first Corinthians 13, he says, though I speak with the tongue of angels, you know, I, it, it is a heavenly language. And that is what speaking in tongues is. It is not making up something. It is not witchcraft or voodoo. It is a prayer language that is beyond our comprehension, but it flows from the spirit. And I can attest to it. OK, I can attest to it. Now, again, at the end of First Corinthians 12, it says, do all speak with tongues? I've got a, one brother in Christ that comes to mind that, that does not believe in speaking in tongues and is a prayer language. But he's my brother. OK, we are brothers in Christ. So I'm not condemning here, but I do believe it is a benefit and I do believe in it. And I'm trying to explain what what it means. OK, here in Ephesians six, we're going to close with this. He says, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. OK, praying in the spirit builds you up and it helps you. And I want you to understand that it is something that is from the life of Christ that is beyond our comprehension. OK, now, whether you receive that at this time or not about praying in tongues, receive what I said about the, the spirit of Christ comes into you crying Abba Father and then by that spirit you cry Abba Father well that as well that way whether we speak in in an unknown tongue or whether we speak in a tongue we understand in this way whether we do that or this we are still doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus amen so that way we glorify God through him and the life of Christ in us is magnified and we understand like Paul said he said when I'm weak I'm made strong <laughs> I didn't mean to go here but it's so good we're gonna go there we need not to condemn one another, okay? Oh, Romans 14 is such a beautiful passage because he talks about how there's differences, okay? Everybody don't believe exactly the same, but that don't mean they're not saved. Hallelujah. He, he besought the Lord that this thorn in his flesh would be removed, but I like what followed. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you, in the areas where you are weak, that's where the strength of Christ is, is known. And so that's where the Lord really works at in the areas where you're weak. But the, the proud he resists, but the humble there's grace given to. Most gladly, look what Paul says, most gladly, therefore, where I rather glory in my infirmities, in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. OK, he's saying I'm acknowledging my weakness so that I'm not looking to myself, but I'm looking to Christ so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Look what he says. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, not just for being hard headed. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is when I turn away from myself and say it's not me no more, but it's the life of Christ in me. And in Jesus name, I go forth. That's why we have power in the name of Jesus is because it's not because I'm saying the word right. The seven sons of Sceva said the name of Jesus when they were trying to cast out a demon. Demon said, Jesus, I know, and I've heard of Paul, but who are you? And jumped on them and whooped them. Even though they were saying the name of Jesus, they didn't have the power in the spirit. But Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm made strong. Whenever we turn away from ourselves and acknowledge this is the life of Christ in me, God, reveal Christ. Let me decrease and Christ increase. Let it not be me no more, but Christ that lives in me. And that, beloved, is where life is. But it doesn't coincide with sin. There is a life that goes along with it. And it, First John 2 and 6, whosoever said they abide in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked, because the spirit is not conflicted. The spirit is revealing the same Jesus, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. And we have to deny ourselves, deny the flesh, and obey God just like Jesus did. Okay, don't be deceived by this one save, always save doctrine that says you can just live in sin and you're saved anyway. That is not the gospel, beloved. That is not the gospel. There is now power given, grace given, strength given in the spirit of Christ. And by that spirit, the Bible says if you walk in the spirit in Galatians chapter 5, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's what we got to do. And if we're weak, hey, let's do like Paul. I'm weak, 
But by the Spirit of Christ, I'm fixing to go pray. You know, I'm fixing to go pray, God. It, it ain't about me no more. I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus. You know, by this new life that you've given me, now I have access unto you and understanding that it is this new life in me. And we're not boasting in ourselves, but we're saying, God, it's not me no more. I'm a wretched sinner. But because of this life in me, now I'm walking in this newness of life. Now, that don't mean that you're, you're Jesus, but that means it's shared with you. It is engrafted into you. That strength makes up where you're weak at. Okay, there are weaknesses that we have, but that strength kicks in right there. It doesn't replace your spirit, your personality, okay, but it is a unity that is joined with it in order to help you. Okay, and that's what we saw. Uh, uh, what was I going with that? <coughs> okay. It is a unity that helps you, and that's what we saw over here. I'm about to close this, but... Uh, Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our weaknesses. There are our weaknesses and we still got them, but the spirit kicks in to help us. And that's what I'm saying. When we go, when we're, we're going through anything, we need to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. That It ain't about me, not about my ability no more, but it's about the life of Christ in me. Okay. And that way we give glory to God and all things through Jesus Christ. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Okay, unified. Don't mean that, that he, he, you are his spirit, but it is a unity there. Okay, and this is in the context of, you know, uh, man and woman being joined together are one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. There's two, but it's unity. Okay, and the Lord unifies his spirit with us. And by that spirit, I'm telling you, beloved, we have all things that we need, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. This is the truth. May the Lord bless you.